There are a lot of Christmases. There's the quiet ones, which occurs for most people every year, and yet always seem to be spoken of as if it came as a surprise. Wasn't it a very quiet Christmas this year? Oh, indeed. Sure, it's over before you know it, after all the preparation. There's the child's Christmas. Not quiet at all. A Christmas of glistening eyes and lit faces and hopes and excitement that turns to tiredness and crying and overeating that sat satiates or sickens children of all ages. Overeating can do that. There's a drink in Christmases too. Excuses for some, tiring round for others, habitually cited as exhausting and rarely as satisfying. There's a homecoming Christmas too, which touches in its way, I mean its unconscious, unaware way, the Christmas that God began. It's a Christmas orchestrated by those who prepare and wait for and welcome in their own particular Bethlehem and by those who prepare and travel gift-bearing to their own particular Bethlehem expecting hoping for welcome and for love to bear them in its care and delight and the comfort of being home at last. Gather the people Break the bread. Tell the story. Was, I understand, an old summary of the Mass. One way or another, the world celebrates at least the second syllable of Christmas. And, you know, I don't think you can really separate the syllables completely. I think Christ gets into our Christmas willy-nilly. Oh, there are terrible Christmases in some homes. Christmas and Calvary. But in the world as a whole, Christ achieves some signs of his promise to the world. In the gathering, in the breaking of bread together, in the story written by someone's love for someone. Then there's the real Christmas, the one be that began with the first one and still happens every year. God comes as Christ to join the human race. From Pope John Paul's telling, one would believe that it was a difficult coming for God and remains so. Oh, he made it look simple, and that's the way we see it. The world coos over babies, but we don't spend our lives cooing, and babies hear harsher sounds very soon. God did not find it easy to insinuate himself into the human race. He had to keep working at it and it took him 33 years. Christmas was only fully achieved on Calvary when Christ had failed enough and died enough to be fully one of us. In a certain sense, God had gone too far. 
becoming a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. We don't like to let people get too close to us. Closeness means not just an invasion of our space and so loss of freedom, but it means challenge and obligation too. Christ elicits the impression that it was too much. Man was no longer able to tolerate such closeness. And thus the protest began. This great protest has precise names. First, it is called synagogue, their synagogue, and then Islam. Neither can accept a God who is so human. It is not suitable, they say, to speak of God in this way. He must remain absolutely transcendent. He must remain pure majesty. Majesty full of mercy, certainly, but not to the point of paying for the faults of his own creatures for their sins. There are lesser protests. Ours is the Christian one. It's not the transcendence of God that worries us, but the transparency of God. Making it so clear to us what Christmas really is and should be each year and always. So let's look at Christmas. What's Christmas anyway? As this world goes, Christmas, the first Christmas, and still the real Christmas, is a feast of the inappropriate and the unexpected. As this world thinks, you wouldn't expect God to be born in a stable, or to live a friend of sinners, prostitutes, or die among thieves. We would not expect that. As far as the world goes, you mightn't expect God at all. But God came in the flesh. That's Christmas for you. Inappropriate, unexpected God turning up in an unexpected way, in an unexpected shape, in an unexpected place. That's Christmas for you. Real Christmas. God with us. Neither a borrower nor a lender be the world's wisdom. But Christ comes, the Lord of the borrowed, a borrowed birthplace and a borrowed death place, the manger and the tomb. And he comes lending too, lending grace and meaning to poverty and all that goes with it and all it goes without. Like all babies, this baby tends to stand the world on its head, to ask for unreasonable sacrifice and to give unreasonable delight. Unreasonable. Except that love, real love, goes way beyond reason. That's Christmas for you. And did you notice what happens in this inappropriate place with this unreasonable child? 
reconciliations take place that reason could never achieve. It takes love. In the stable, even the animals lie unhunted, at peace with the human race. In the stable, there's no competition between the man and the woman, only delight in the presence of a baby. In the stable, there's no class war or class distinction, and no division between home and away or between town and gown. There is a place for shepherds from near, and there's a place for wise men from afar. And look at it's the same place. Kneeling by the baby, they are at peace. That's Christmas for you. It's that kind of place, this stable. A place that makes friends of all who gather there. A place of no jealousy. A place of the oldest story of human joy. Oh, as old as Eden. A place of hope, a place of love, and a place of faith. That's Christmas for you. The unexpected God comes there, knowing no language but touch and luck and sound. Would you ever expect a God who answers only to softness of skin, to gentleness of touch, to sweetness of luck, inappropriate God. There are opposites, roughness, violence, anger, hate, have no power with this God. their opposites, roughness, violence, anger, hate, have no power with this God. Only the weak things of the world have power in this stable. Only the weak things of the world have power in this stable. That's Christmas for you. God saying, let's stay in touch. That's what every baby cries for, babies of all ages. And God cries for it too. Christmas is the feast of staying in touch. Heaven in touch with earth. God in touch with people me in touch with you by hand sign of peace by card christmas card by phone voices in the air peace on earth by visit the second joyful mystery by gift a star lighting the darkness a star lighting the darkness that's what a gift does for us it brightens up the darkness of our lives Mary's hand Joseph's hand holding him wrapping him rocking him cuddling him not God in an idea, but God in a word. God in a touch. Let's stay in touch, says God. For this staying in touch is the closeness that consoles the crying. 
it's it comforts the lonely and gives peace to the dying that's Christmas for you let's stay in touch for this is the closeness that consoles the dying comforts the lonely and gives peace to the crying three very important things just staying in touch staying in touch let's stay in touch for this is the closeness that consoles the crying comforts the lonely and gives peace to the dying that's Christmas for you but it needs someone always someone for softness of skin for gentleness of touch for sweetness of look for kindness of voice it needs someone always someone for reconciliation and the healing of wounds and the making up of rows and the giving of peace it needs someone always someone to light the road to renew hope to restore faith to return love it needs someone always someone to light the road to renew hope to restore faith to return love Christ came that first Christmas it needs someone this Christmas too and please God that someone will be you